Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to this session on big data and machine learning. So for those of you, uh, given that this is quite a crowded room, if you're suddenly going, that's not the session I was meant to be in, here's your moment to, to gracefully exit. Um, but I'm seeing, in fact, that more people are arriving, which, which is lovely. Um, let me commence by, as others have, acknowledging the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional owners of our land, Australia. And I specifically acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of this beautiful, beautiful place we now call Sydney. This session looks at how behavioural science applications can be improved using large, complex data sets and by applying advanced statistical techniques of machine learning, which is, of course, the next cutting edge of behavioural science. These techniques will allow us in future much better than we can now to predict and target policy intervention. I'm Theresa Dickinson, a Deputy Government Statistician at the Australian Bureau of Statistics, and until recently I was Deputy Government Statistician at Statistics New Zealand. And this means that I've had the privilege of seeing how two relatively similar countries, although perhaps not in size, but certainly, certainly in style, uh, approaching the use of large complex data sets in public policy creation and evaluation. In New Zealand, the social investment model, which is using data held by StatsNZ in its integrated data infrastructure, has been really very widely adopted to support targeting um, of policy interventions, and it's now routinely used in the New Zealand annual budget cycle, and Sarah will talk more about that in her presentation. In Australia, we are in the, the midst of some very exciting developments with longitudinal integrated data assets being created for both business data and for personal data. Uh, ABS is spearheading part of that work around the, the creation of the data sets and collaborating with a number of agencies, including Data61, uh, under the banner of the Data Integration Partnerships for Australia. And there's now growing examples of that Australian data being used to inform policy positions and research more generally, um, such as that on firm and sector productivity. In doing this work, both Australia and New Zealand show very common and stringent approaches to managing data security and confidentiality and ensuring that the work is being done with what's generally ex considered acceptable to the public, or we call it social licence. Um, and I wanted to emphasise that. Uh, we're sort of in the business these days, wherever we go and we talk about the value of the data that we hold, we never do that without talking about the security and confidentiality mechanisms that we place around that data. We're in for a, a treat in this session. We have four really interesting speakers. Uh, Michael Sanders, Bill Simpson-Young and Beck Weeks will talk about identifying behavioural biases and targeting populations, while Sarah, Sarah Minson will speak about the type of insights that can be derived from big data and the importance of data governance and data management. So let's, let's begin. Let's rip right into it with Michael's talk. Michael is Chief Scientist at the Behavioural Insights team in the UK. And for those of you who don't know, as I didn't until I started um, learning a little bit more about this world, the Behavioural Insights team was the world's first government institution that was dedicated to the application of behavioural sciences. So Michael and his team support the rest of the Behavioural Insights group with the design of randomised control trials, the gold standard, as we keep hearing, which, which I'm going to put an aside in here. I'm very chuffed. Um, I come from a statistical background and spent um, some years in the first part of my career teaching experimental design. And randomised control trials um, are one aspect of that. So it's really nice to see them uh, burgeoning and being used in, in a very different context. Uh, Michael's also a member of the uh, BITS Ventures team and working on test and build of BITS online platform to help streamline the process of developing behavioural insights informed interventions in the areas of fraud, error and debt. Michael is an Associate Fellow of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford where he teaches behavioural science and also a Fellow of Harvard University's Behavioural Insights Group. So Michael is going to explain why there's a data services team within BIT and discuss their report that came out in November using data science in policy, which highlights several applications of machine learning to behavioural public policy. And Michael, I believe you're also going to discuss the latest results from a range of projects, such as predicting case escalation in social care. So just as we begin, um, for those of you that would like to ask a question of the speakers um, for the later part, you can ask it live here in the room, or you can go to this, this website uh, to do that. 
And now, please join with me in welcoming Michael. Hey, thank you. So I'm told I need to touch my name, if I can remember which one my name is. Excellent. Oh, so, okay, so hello. I'm going to move around a little bit while I'm talking because I can't stand still and talk at the same time, which is a bit of an affliction. I'm also conscious that we're all supposed to be dressed in business attire, and I'm wearing jeans, so I'm going to start off by talking about that because my dear colleague in the front has already mentioned it, and I'm now feeling a little bit self-conscious. <laughs> Uh, so I was wearing a suit at 5 o'clock this morning when my 15-week-old baby threw up on it. Um, and stupidly, I only bought the one suit with me to Australia. So sorry, it's not that I think I'm too cool to wear a suit. Um, I don't think I'm too cool for anything. Um, I just have been a victim of circumstance. And thank you so much for bringing that up um, just now. So having gotten that out of the way and used approximately two of my 15 minutes to discuss my own clothing, uh, let's now proceed to actually talk about machine learning. So the Behavioral Insights team doesn't traditionally do machine learning. We do randomized control trials, the gold standard of evaluation, and we do behavioral science first and foremost. So we now do uh, data science. We set up our data science team in January 2017. Over the course of the next 12 or so minutes, I'm hoping I'll be able to give you a good sense of why it is that we have set up that team and what we set it up to do. So we set up with a mission um, given to us by David Halpern, which subsequently exploded, uh, to produce three exemplar projects showing nimble practical use of data science in government. So where a statistics bureau or other a major government department uh, might need to spend years and years trying to develop a perfect project using lots of very complicated data. Our job was to do it very quickly. Um, in fact, so quickly that David said we had one year to set up the team, get it going, and have three projects deliver and be able to report on. Otherwise, we'd be out of a job. So how did we do? Well, still here. So could be going worse. Uh, so uh, we published in December last year, 12 months in, about 11 and a half months in if we're counting, and David's in the room. Uh, we published our exemplar report, which had not three, but in fact, I believe that's eight different examples of projects. So we were looking at predicting which schools are most likely to fail inspection. So we're looking at when and where car crashes are most likely to occur, trying to uh, better target behavioral science interventions, trying to predict whether GPs were good or bad or indifferent, and a whole range of other things. The thing I want to talk to you most about today, however, is one of these examples, um, which is, as we've already mentioned, identifying high-risk cases in children's social care. So children's social care is an area that is very dear to me personally, because my wife is a social worker. Um, and I think it should be dear to all of us. It's an area where we haven't done a great deal of work in behavioral science yet, but we're talking about tens or hundreds of thousands of the most vulnerable children in our society. And so if we're not doing work in behavioral science and data science in this area, then we really have to ask ourselves, why is it that we're not doing that? Um, so that's what we're gonna be, I'm going to be talking about mainly here. So we have a process we work through in every data science project in which we assess the problem, we predict, we use the machine learning part, which you might think that should come later in the process, but that is actually the second of our phases. We then do an explore phase, similar to what we would do in any behavioral science project. We go out and we try and understand what's going on in the context. Um, and then we either scale or expand. The reason there's two options there is because I like using X's in my acronyms. And so if, I, if it's expand, then I can call it APEX, which I think is cool. Um, however, as mentioned previously, I'm not cool. Um, and so I feel like we should go with scale, which makes it apes. <laughs> which is fine, right? We're, you know, we're putting Homo sapiens back into Homo economicus. We're all about the apes here in BI. So um, answers on a postcard, whether you think APEX or apes should be our mnemonic going forward. And I promise to take this as a, only an advisory referendum and act on it only if I see fit. Um, so let's talk about understanding to, to, to that, escalation in children's social care. So let's take a look at the context. So in one local authority we're working with, which is the one local authority we worked with, we have 32,000 contacts. What's a contact? So you are worried about the person sat next to you. You think that their parents don't love them. You think their parents haven't looked after them well enough? Do you think they've got maybe some bruises? Obviously, they're a child in this context. Uh, or you think that their school uniform hasn't been washed for a few weeks, and that's a cause for concern. You can ring up local social services, and you can say, I'm worried about this child. I'm worried about Mintech, for example. Um, or I'm worried about Sam, or I'm worried about Kate, or I'm worried about Fiona from Melbourne, Australia. See, I did manage to get it in. Um, it's a standing joke. It isn't funny to anybody but one person, but I'm on stage, so you can't stop me. Um, so you can do that. Or uh, if, uh, if there's a domestic violence issue and the police are called out, then the police have, and there's a child present in the house, the police have a responsibility to report it to social services. So anything like that is a contact. That's a contact. What then happens is the social workers take a look at the 
case. They say, does it pass some threshold for looking at it? So does it seem like it's trivial? Does it seem like it's not actually a big issue? Does it seem like it's perhaps um, motivated by reasons other than concern for the child, for example? So if Sam and I are going through a bitter divorce um, and we, I'm saying that I think Sam's a terrible parent to our daughter, um, then I might want to sort of refer him to social services. They can say, actually, that's not a legitimate case. Um, so all those cases they think are legitimate get taken through as referrals, and about 11,000 of those do. And then they go for an assessment over 45 days. So a social worker goes out, they introduces, interviews the family, extended and sort of more nuclear. Um, it interviews the teachers, parents, police, anybody around the family. Um, and they decide in about half of these cases to take no further action. They go no further, they said nothing to see here. Of those, about 1,693, in fact, exactly 693 of them, come back. And of those, a subset, about 580, they come back as serious cases. So a serious case here is defined as the case either gets the child gets taken into care, so they get put into foster services, or we have what's called a Section 47 Child Protection Plan, which is where, essentially, there is regular monitoring visits by social workers to ensure that the child is being looked after. This is, these are the statutory instruments we use to protect children in the UK. So that's, this is what we're looking at. What we're looking at in particular is of these 5,000 cases that get NFA'd, which ones of those are going to come back within six months and escalate, so become a more serious or severe case? That's what we're looking for. Because that might mean that the case either shouldn't have been sent for no further action in the first place, or it could mean that the case was just had characteristics and it was prone to escalate very quickly. So that's, that's what we're looking for. Okay. So that's the same diagram again. So what we had in terms of our data were basic characteristics of the child, so their age, their relationships, so who their parents are, so they know that uh, Mintek is, Mintek and I share Sam, Sam's a son of ours, uh, Sam is, has a different surname to one of us, but the same surname as the other, um, it has the romantic history of our parents, if that's known to social services, that kind of thing, and also has um, code words f uh, coded by the social worker, so they've said alcohol and drugs are risks in this family, for example. Um, we also then have assessment notes, which are the notes which are taken over the course of the of this 45 days. So there's thousands and thousands of words in there, and then referral notes, which are a bit shorter. So this is what happens when the social worker decides to take it from the, that contact phase to a referral phase. So Sam came in, um, dirty school uniform, some signs of bruising. We decided to take it forward. That's the, that's the referral note. It's typically about 50 to 100 words. So we had that, and then we removed anything relating to ethnicity or nationality or primary language. And this is to try and avoid uh, racially profiling anybody or, or having that come out of the model. This is not a perfect way of dealing with those problems, we acknowledge. However, we have the slight advantage in this sense and only in this sense from an analytical perspective, which is that the authority we worked in is about 98% white, um, so there are not a lot of ethnic profiling going on there because there's nobody to ethnically profile. Not a bonus in general, but for the pur purposes of this model, it is a little bit helpful. Um, so most of what we're looking at here is text. So most of the data, most of the information in social care is text. There's not a lot of not a lot of data recorded in machine readable format in the traditional sense. We have these buckets and buckets of text. So social workers write at great length in these pseudo legal documents everything they record in their interviews with everybody around the family. And it's hard to analyze text using traditional analysis because there's so much of it. And when we do analyze it using traditional analysis or even using machine learning normally, it becomes hard to interpret at the other end. And that's not a problem if you're just trying to flag to a social worker, this is a high-risk case. But if you want the social worker to actually do something as a consequence of that in a targeted way, it might be helpful if they understand what it is that your model is producing. So what we use is topic modeling, which is an informed of, un of unsupervised machine learning to identify themes, so, sent so groups of words or structures of words or things like sentences, topics that come up repeatedly in cases. So we're not, we're not telling you what to look for here. We're just saying go look for anything that occurs commonly together. And it can, this is, has a number of advantages, not least of which is the fact that it can handle the fact that social workers make spelling mistakes or they're human beings. And so they don't all write in exactly the same way, unlike the rational automata that we wished that they were. I should say in defense of social workers that social workers actually make relatively few spelling mistakes um, compared this is to the police. So there are in one year's tranche of metropolitan police data on mobile phone thefts, there are 95 different ways of spelling different models of iPhone. And this was several years ago when there were even fewer models of iPhone than there are now. If, you, if, if a policeman can spell the model of a mobile phone wrong, they will. Which is fine, they're, they're, they're busy. They have other things to be doing with their time. Um, but, and just for in case anybody in here is a policeman and is looking to go back to their jurisdictions, it's P-H-O-N-E-E. -E. <laughs> 
OK, so that's what we're just talking about. So that's, that's what that we get with the data. What happens when we do this assessment, we do the prediction? So this is a rock curve. This essentially is estimating for us how good of a job we are doing at predicting those cases that are likely to escalate. So along the x-axis, we have the proportion of NFA cases that we're taking. So if we go all the way to the end of that, that's where we're taking all of the cases and saying they're all high risk, which, of course, we can't do. If we go up the... Uh, y-axis, that is the proportion of cases we're catching that actually end up being high risk. So if we were just randomly take, kicking out cases, then if we, uh, if we take out 20% of the cases, we'd expect to take out 20% of the high risk cases. So the higher these curves are, the better. So what we see is that when we, use no when we don't use the text data, we only use the standard covariate analysis, um, what we get is a pretty good model that if we take about a 20% sample, it's picking up about 40% of the case escalations, but it's not picking up by any means, sort of all of them. When we add in the text, we do actually much, much better. So sort of 70% off of that kind of 20% sample, which is, we think, pretty impressive. Um, this is sort of, this is one of our better models. Uh, for a slightly easier way of looking at this, if we take 1,000 cases, and we take the 6% highest risk cases, and 6% that we've chosen as a threshold for two reasons. Firstly, it makes us look good, um, and secondly, because that is the level of resource which the local authority we're working with has to actually intervene. They can, in they can intervene out of every 1,000 cases that come through on another 60. So we want to pick the 60 highest risk cases. So if we take roughly the highest six, the, the, actually the 58 highest risk cases in this case, then of those, 52 of them are two, uh, true positives. That means of those cases, 52 of those 60 will actually come back as an escalated case, and only six of them are false positives. So only six of them don't go, don't escalate. So that's a pretty, pretty high true positive rate. And very, very importantly, because we're talking about intervening on young people and their families, we have a very low false positive rate. And we want to be driving that down still further. So that's that. So what we do then do is we go to an explore phase. What the topic model throws out is word clouds, essentially. It doesn't actually throw out word clouds. R throws out word clouds after we ask it to, after it's thrown out the topic model. Um, so we have these word clouds. And these are basically mixtures of words that occur regularly with cases that are high risk and which proceed to escalate. However, what do they actually mean? What we do is we go and we interview social workers, about 20, 30 social workers for this project, and we get them to tell us what they mean. So if you were to write down in your case notes this selection of words, what would that be meaning? So things like disguise compliance, which is the parents are basically pushing the problems under the rugs while we're there. They're committing to go into rehab. They're stopping drinking for now, but they're just doing it until we get out the door. And we can, this seems like social workers are trained to detect that kind of thing. So that's what we find out from these interviews, which is really helpful. And then having worked out not just who's likely to escalate, what is predicting that kind of escalation, and what that actually means in practice to social workers, we can then work at how can we actually put that into practice. How can I actually do something with it? So this is what we're doing to expand it now. So we've worked with one local authority. We've now taken this up to 12 local authorities, because it could be we just got lucky with the one super white um, local authority we were working with originally. So this is taking it to a pretty large scale. We're also taking it to see whether or not it can be applied in adoption and fostering. So to see, to check whether or not uh, after children are taken into care, we can predict the stability of their placement. So are they likely to last in those foster placements, which would mean we can put in additional support if we think that they're not likely to. Importantly, we're also using this for shadow boxing. So what we're able to do is we're able to produce essentially pseudo cases, so not real cases, but which have the same properties as real cases, um, which are high risk. We can give them to experienced social workers. One of the things that comes through from our data is it turns out more experienced social workers are better at social working than less experienced social workers. It's how I managed to cling on to my job, is just by age alone. <laughs> not clear that it applies to econometricians. Um, we get them, we show them this case, say, what would you do in this case? What would you, when would you escalate it? Who would you escalate to? What services would you refer to? We can get them to give us those answers, and then we can train the machine to learn what, what kind of answers are given to what kind of cases. And it means when we come back again to more junior social workers, less experienced social workers, who we know are less good at making these decisions or make them more slowly or have to ask their colleagues for help, we can present them with those answers in advance. So they can learn through both training and, through, and on the job. They can learn how to actually apply these the, the, the outcomes from the model, how we can actually do their jobs better. And the final thing we're doing is we're bringing that all together into a digital tool. So this is what the current draft of our digital tool looks like. You're a social worker, you write your thousands of words of text, um, and then you press go, or your manager presses go on our algorithm. It runs through this. This is all fake cases, I should say. This isn't real. Um, and then what it does is it pulls up the paragraphs you've written, that the, 
the algorithm thinks indicate their high risk. And then it, it highlights those for you, and it tells you what topic it is, what thing that the social workers, your colleagues have identified, is associated with that. So this is uh, the family environment, or parenting support challenges, or disguised compliance is paragraph. So you can see, this is, we think this is a high risk case. These are the things that you've written that tell us it's a high risk case, and this is a behavioral thing, right? So we're asking people to use an algorithm. We know people experience algorithm revision. They're really reluctant to use it in the day-to-day -day life. We're saying, this isn't an algorithm, this is you. We have an algorithm that's kind of helping you along a little bit, but it's basically just your decision that's being made here. So we showed you that, and then if you don't know what to do, if, you, if you're puzzled or confused, then we say, okay, well, you can just go to these info and resources, and you can use them, and you can ho hopefully that'll help you to be able to make a better decision or a faster decision, or maybe the same decision you was, as you would have made anyway. We're not forcing anybody down this kind of line. So that's what this tool is doing. We're hoping to have this in the field in our pilot local authority in the next few months. So just to very briefly summarize, we think that machine learning has real potential to help the most vulnerable people in our society. Um, but it really can't be a replacement for human beings. When you talk to sort of people about machine learning, oh, it'll, just, it'll get rid of all of our jobs. And this isn't the case here, because we need social workers to be writing those case notes. We need that first-hand human experience of interviewing dozens of people in order to get that to happen. And then we need to be supplementing their decisions with the insights from that algorithm. And that algorithm is, is itself trained on human beings. So we really can't replace that. And this is, it needs to be, as I say, it needs to be iteratively involved with the human beings who are actually running this process. So that's everything. I'll stop. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. That, thank you. That was fascinating. And the comment that I wrote down on it is it's aug augmented humanity. Um, because that's what social workers, um, no matter how jaded they can get by their profession, they're, they're in the business of humanity towards children. And this is a way to just do it a little bit more systematically. Can I that um, now um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sarah. Uh, Sarah Minson is the General Manager of Custo Customer Support and Development at Stats NZ, where she has spent the last 12 years, and for nine of those years she worked on the population census, but right at the moment has responsibility for dissemination of all of Stats NZ statistics, data and insights, and also for the integrated data infrastructure that Stats NZ runs, and also its business equivalent. So the IDI is a large uh, research database that holds linked microdata about people and households, and I will say that it is the envy of statistical offices around the world, including Australia. The IDI is really very lauded as um, an enormous resource that's been very well used. So Sarah and her team are, are working hard to ensure that the significant asset that is integrated data is managed well in terms of keeping da people's data safe, but that it is also utilised to enable more insights. Sarah is going to discuss the origins and mission of New Zealand's integrated data infrastructure and, and its um, companion, the Longitudinal Business Database, and highlight the importance of data governance and secure access. She's also going to discuss some New Stats New Zealand supported case studies that have addressed behavioural bias or that have a heuristic aspect. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yes, I'm very pleased to be here from Stats NZ across the ditch to talk about our integrated data infrastructure. And as Theresa said, we have two big databases, one which uh, contains linked business information called our Longitudinal Business Database. I'm not really talking about that much today. What I really want to talk to you about is uh, what we call the IDI, the Integrated Data Infrastructure, uh, which is our large integrated database of de-identified longitudinal microdata about individuals. Um, on this, oh, if I'd started the presentation, there we go. Um, so this gives you a view of the type of information that is in the IDI. We have a huge range of information right from right across government, also data from non-government organisations, and of course data from Statistics New Zealand, including our population census. And the IDI is accessed by researchers doing research into complex issues that affect New Zealanders. And towards the end of my presentation, I'll give you a couple of examples of how the IDI is used. But you can see on the screen um, that there is information from Ministry of Health, from Education, there's tax data, there's data on benefits, there's justice data, and there's population data. And that's only a, a sample of all the information that we have. 
Our journey started back in 2014 and possibly slightly before that. And at the time, it was a really big deal in New Zealand to link individual data and make it available to researchers. And it was the first time that New Zealand had done that. Um, we've come a long way and the IDI is um, well used and as Teresa said, it is um, certainly the envy of many countries and we talk to a lot of countries around the world who are moving fast in this direction, including Australia. There's three key things to note about this data. Firstly, as I've said, it's integrated. So it's data about people linked across a number of different sources. It's also de-identified. So obvious identifiers like your name, your address, your tax number have been removed or replaced before the data is available to researchers. And it's not about identifying or locating individuals, it's about understanding groups with certain characteristics. And the third thing to note about the IDI is that it's longitudinal. So we can follow people over time and we can see the impact of events and we can see what factors are associated with certain outcomes. So it's the integrated and longitudinal nature of the IDI that allows us to tackle previously unanswerable questions. So how do we do it? What you can see um, in that picture there, uh, we talk about the spine of the IDI or the backbone of the IDI, and that's where we start. So that's a data set that contains the majority of people in New Zealand. And we make the spine from linking birth information, tax information, and immigration visa data. So most people in New Zealand will interact with at least one of those data sources. And all the data sources that we have are linked to the spine one-to-one, -one, and that avoids a complicated tangle of links. We estimate that there are around 166 billion facts or data points in the IDI, and it is growing. And there are roughly 10 million people in the IDI. Now in New Zealand, our population is around 4.8 million. So you can see there's more people in the data set than uh, currently live in New Zealand. But that's because the IDI has what we call the ever-resident population. So it's people who were born in New Zealand, who immigrated to New Zealand, or who have ever worked here. We have birth data going back to 1920, but the bulk of the data that we have is from the mid-1990s onwards. So that's what it is. Uh, now I'm going to talk about how it's used. So the IDI and also the LBD, which is the Longitudinal Business Database, is used by researchers from central and local government, from tertiary institutions, from non-government organisations, from iwi, and from research organisations. We did some research recently looking at the four, type, four main types of research being done in the IDI. The first is population estimation, so the counts and characteristics of populations of interest, so for example, the number of people on a benefit who live in a certain geographic area. The second type of research is research with a social science or public policy focus. The third is scenario or simulations, so creating models to simulate the effects of policy interventions, for example. And the fourth one is research into statistics. So creating new statistical measures or understanding the opportunities and limits of administrative data. And that's an area in particular that Statistics New Zealand has been doing work into. So we've been looking at what is the administrative population data that's available and could we use that to replace our population census. The revolution so far, however, has not been in new methods, but in applying good, solid statistical practice to new data sets that are finally available to answer key questions. So for example, by assessing the economic and health outcomes of beneficiaries who gain employment, or social housing applicants who are granted a house, and comparing them to the same outcomes for a control group. The statistical and econometric methods to do this are not new. What is new is the availability of data on a large number of people who received the intervention and people who did not. So as people have said, this is about being able to control for many variables and get the best impact of the best, sorry, the best estimate of the actual impact. Another method that is being used is large micro simulations, and there are several of these active in the IDI at the moment. Typically these involve many models with many explanatory variables and dependencies between each other. 
where the researchers can use the results to simulate at the person level what might happen to the population of New Zealand as a whole. For example, if we made changes to taxation or made changes to child, policy, child uh, welfare payments. Again, the statistics and economics behind these micro simulations is not new. It's just a matter of having all the data together and enough computing power and skilled person power to specify the models and arrange the data for them. Although most of the analysis is traditional statistical and econometric modelling, some researchers are applying machine learning techniques to data in the IDI. Now this is a screenshot from our prototype population explorer. Now I don't expect you to be able to, I was just seeing how big it looked on the screen, <laughs> it's tiny on my screen, I don't really need you to be able to see it um, so much as if you can get a copy of the slides later you can look at it more closely. The main function of this prototype is to give a wide range of simple but flexible cross tabs to profile various subpopulations. So this lets the user specify an outcome of interest, and in this case what's on the screen is the number of interactions with mental health and addiction services, a cohort of interest, which has been defined here by birth year, a starting year and outcome year, and it uses machine learning to identify which variables in the starting year are useful predictors of the outcomes in the outcomes year. And I'm told by my team that it combines a random forest with elastic net regularization. But I have no idea what that is. <laughs> so if you want to know more, you'll need to talk to my team back in Wellington. Other researchers are also using modern machine learning methods like this. But the fact is that the data currently in our IDI lends itself to traditional research questions rather than the nuances of microbehaviours. We don't yet have a lot of data on subtle biases, like where people click their mouse or whether people procrastinate over insurance forms. What we do have is higher level economic and social data on things like what pharmaceuticals they purchased, when they visited the hospital, what their income is, and whether they're on benefits. So now I'm going to give you two examples of how the IDI has been used. The New Zealand Treasury studied children aged 0 to 14, and they identified four key indicators for children at high risk of poor outcomes later in life. And those four findings are having a government agency finding of abuse or neglect, being mostly supported by benefits since birth, having a parent with a prison sentence, and having a mother with no formal qualifications. Children with these indicators were more likely to experience referral to the youth justice service, to not achieve any school qualifications, to be on a sole parent benefit by 21, or as an adult, either be on a benefit for five or more years, or receive a prison or community sentence. So this work fed into a large number of policy programs, including significantly the development of a new ministry, the Ministry for Children, Oranga Tamariki. The second example I've got will be a particular interest if anyone in the room was born in 1978 specifically. Our Ministry of Justice uh, used the IDI to look at the outcomes of people born in 1978 and they were looking at offending outcomes. Of the babies born in 1978 in New Zealand, one in four now have a criminal conviction. Many of these convictions are for shoplifting and careless driving, so they're not all murderers. And you'll see on screen that for men, that's one in three, and for war, Maori, people of Maori and Pacifica background, that's one in two. The most prolific offenders started young, between 17 and 22 years of age. And the research showed that the window for intervention was very narrow. You need to get to these kids before their first offence, which meant before they were 14 years old. And after the age of 22, most of your opportunity for successful intervention was lost. The research also discovered that after the first offence, partnerships with schools and other youth-focused youth service providers was really important and made a difference. So this is a type of hugely valuable research that is possible when you have linked longitudinal data about individuals. So where to next? At the moment, Statistics New Zealand is very much focused on um, being able to add more and more data to the IDI uh, and allow more and more researchers in. Three years ago, we had around 150 researchers in the IDI. Today, we have over 600. 
So we're constantly looking at how to respond to new demands, how to make it easier for people to access the IDI, but also uh, have a very strong focus still on protecting people's privacy and confidentiality, and extending what's possible with integrated data. And there's two really exciting new research projects that are coming up that I'd like to mention. In the first New Zealand study of its kind, researchers will use machine learning to improve the prediction of cardiovascular events and associated with health costs. And the second exciting piece of research that's coming up is very soon we will be linking rugby register data into the IDI. And that will be the first time that we've linked privately collected data. This will enable research into the long-term health impacts for rugby players, both the positive in terms of the benefits of playing our national game and the negative impacts, including the long-term impacts of concussion injury. So the benefits to New Zealand of having integrated individual level data is very significant. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for that, Sarah. And um, I was feeling quite nostalgic there hearing about the IDI and the fact that it's moved on already in the, the few months that I've been gone and the, the opportunities now to, to look at that data being used in different ways with different techniques is fantastic. Um, I'm now really pleased to introduce Bill, Bill Simpson Young, who is a member of the Data61 executive team and Director of Engineering and Design. Uh, for those of us who don't know, Data61 is Australia's largest data innovation group and it was formed in 2016 under the CSIRO banner. Bill leads a group of software engineers, user experience designers and data scientists in developing new software technologies and products in data privacy, spatial technologies, logic systems and machine learning. And in doing this work, Data61 collaborates widely, including with the Australian Bureau of Statistics, where we're developing shared intellectual property to maintain data security and confidentiality. Bill started out as a software engineer and has spent most of his career in R&D leadership. He's worked for global technology companies, including Canon and Unisys, in government-funded research institutions, and in research and teaching in university, and is currently teaching at the University of Sydney. His interest is in leading R&D teams to develop novel technologies and products right from research through to deployed systems in use. And he's led teams to develop several technologies which are now being used globally. Uh, Bill is going to discuss the origins and mission of the Data Integration Project for Australia, which I mentioned earlier, DIPA, and how CSRO Data 61 fits into it. And maybe in passing he might speak about how the ABS fits into it as well. Um, He's also going to discuss some of the different projects that have been supported by Data61. He will uh, make a few comments about the ethical use of machine learning and notably how human bias can creep into algorithms for machine learning and what can be done to detect and eliminate that particular kind of bias. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Teresa. Um, so just... It, it, I just realised, listening to that, uh, the abstract, that things have changed a bit since, since, since that was written. And actually, I'm not talking much about DIP. I'll just say a little bit up, up front, but most of it will be on, on the last part of what Theresa was talking about, and that's about ethical use of machine learning. So the, um, I, I want to set up a bit of context, but then uh, about the types of things we're doing at Data61 in, 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 in using machine learning uh, for uh, predicting and intervening um, in, 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 in situations, particularly using government data. The, uh, where are we? Now, but, so about half of what I'll be talking about will be the, the overall context, and then I'll get down into the details of actual work we're doing. And uh, to follow on from what Theresa said, uh, we are doing a lot of work with government as part of the Data Integration Partnership Australia. We, we all know now that, that um, like in New Zealand, we have a lot of data being used by government. Uh, we have, have a lot of transactional data, a lot of data from things like social security payments, a lot of things from Medicare and so on. So there's this huge wealth of data that's in government um, and now starting to be utilised a lot more than has been done in the past. Um, similarly in companies, you know, a lot of companies are using data. Now, we, we all know that, and it is becoming more and more mature. Now, the, um, and just to give you some examples of types of things that are being done, the, oh, by the way, so Data61 in this space is doing a lot of work on, protect, on improving data privacy, improving data confidentiality, and doing a lot of work with the ABS that we're very happy with uh, to try to make data such as data about individuals, similar to what, to, to, to what um, Sarah was talking about, 
being more widely accessible to, to not just a, a small number of people, but a large number of people through automatic on the fly confidentialization of, of data so that it can be quite widely used in queries uh, across agencies and so on. Um, and that, that's very exciting work. We're, we're thrilled to be working with the ABS on. There we go. <laughs> okay, the, um, but let, let's now talk about about you know when you're using machine learning, often what you're trying to do is predict behavior. And when you've got all this rich data, it's much more possible to predict behavior. You're, um, if, particularly when you've got longitudinal data, you can be, be predicting what behavior is going to happen and then taking actions based on that. Now, I've just listed a few examples. I could have pages and pages of, of this type of slide. But you know, in education, you might be trying to predict the future performance of a student based on their past performance and demographic characteristics, their home life, uh, and so on. Uh, you might be wanting to, a bank would, and they do this all the time, right? They're trying to predict the likelihood of, it, of an individual being able to repay their mortgage payments in the future and you know, deciding whether or not to give them a home loan based on a prediction of their likelihood to be able to pay their payments. Um, just as you know, when you're actually releasing someone on parole, there's a prediction of whether or not a person is going to re-offend or not, and that gets taken into account in making that, in, that, in that parole decision. So this is happening all the time now. It's happening in human systems, and it's starting to happen more and more in automated systems, and it's happening more and more in what are called socio-technical systems, where you know, the combination of human decisions and machine decisions, which is, is, is what most, most systems are these days. Now, I've, I've got some examples here of um, when you're making a prediction, you could be making a prediction because you're trying to understand public policy, you're trying to develop new public policy, how are people going to behave, that, that's useful. But often, now there's a move to actually use this at an individual level. You can predict what an individual's going to do and how an individual's going to behave. So I think that a lot of the interesting work at the moment in machine learning is personalising action based on the prediction. A lot of the work in behavioural economics is still aimed at that public policy uh, broad brush approach and not a much, as much about the personalisation. Um, the... But with machine learning, with rich data, with rich ways of intervene, intervening, you can actually have a lot more personalisation. So for education, you know, knowing which student to target um, and then what intervention to use for that student to make sure that you're, uh, you're identifying issues early, rather than going out with a, a major policy that affects everyone, you can actually target individuals. I mean, what you often hear in, in behavioural economics, you, you'll hear about a behavioural study which has found 95% of people behave this particular way. Great, let's roll out this new policy. Well, what about the 5%, right? That 5% are going to be affected by your new policy. You need personalisation. So, so um, yeah, good data-based decision-making can, 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 can do this. So, so you know, what is, what's the promise here? The promise here is that with, with, with good data, good machine learning systems, good personalised interventions, you can have better automation of these repetitive tasks. You can scale personalisation. You know, we, can't have, we can't all have a representative sitting in government agencies serving each of, each of us individually. You have to be able to do things at scale with, with technology. Um, you want to be able to continually measure what you're doing, monitor it and improve it. You want to provide a, a cons consistent experience. And, and importantly, and probably most importantly, you want to be able to quantify the risk of the decisions, make predictions about what's going to happen when you actually make an intervention so that you can ameliorate any, any risks from that. Now, so this all sounds great. This great, brave new world, lots of data, lots of interventions, lots of personalisation, but there's big problems, right? And anyone who reads papers, and lots of you probably read papers, anyone who reads books will know about the types of problems that are out there. Great book. If you haven't read it, Weapons of Math Destruction. Who's read Weapons of Math Destruction here? Great book, from 2016, Cathy O'Neill. It goes through a whole bunch of different examples from justice, education, health, um, you, you name it, where there's individuals have been uh, negatively affected by algorithms, right? And that could be, it's not always machine learning that does it, it could be just bad algorithms, it could be um, you know, bad, bad training of data. That first example, these are all real headlines. If you want to find out about any of them, Google them. I don't have time to talk about them. But so, for example, the evaluating New York teachers, that was just a bad algorithm, right? Bad designed system uh, with bad algorithm that was uh, inadvertently or and, and in, um, inappropriately penalising really good teachers uh, through, through poor assessment, automated assessment of them. But then you've got other examples like the, you know, the Google and its racist algorithm. Uh, people may know about the example of the gorilla photos. But in that case, it was presumably... Um, selection bias in the selection of the training data that the machine learning algorithm was trained on. Um, there weren't enough, you know, presumably weren't enough photos of, of black people such that you know, black people were being categorised as gorillas. Right? So a bad selection bias in the way in which the, the system was trained that would part, potentially be, partly be caused by a development team who wouldn't have been testing it with their own photos. You know, maybe there wasn't enough diversity in, in the development team. So a whole bunch of reasons lead to this. Um, 
But there's also a lot of bias in the, um, in, in the data that's out there. So for example, um, if you take the, the one semantics derived automatically from language corpora, if you take all the information that's out there in text, right? And a lot of people are using training systems based on the text that's out there in the world. And that's really useful if you can use the text that's out there to understand about the world as it is or has been. But when you go further and actually utilize that in influencing the future, it can't, isn't always good. So for example, let's say you, you took all the data in the world about salaries you know, over the last 50 years, and you, you detected that, gee, men tend to get paid more, more than women you know, in, in history. That, that's useful knowledge, good to know. Right? If you then are having a job recommendation system that is saying, uh, or sorry, a, a salary determination system that you know, analyzes the, the history of people, sees that someone, what gender someone is, and then determines what pay they should be based, based on history. Not a good solution, right? You, know, you, can't, you don't want the biases of the past, the human biases of the past, to, to be learnt by the machines so that machines become as biased as the past humans. Right? We want technology to help us progress, not regress. Right? So another example, you, know, you don't want, if you're analysing language corpora, you might find there's a stronger association between man and doctor than between man and nurse, and between woman and nurse than, than woman and doctor. Right? That association is out there in language, and that's found by one of, the, <coughs> one of these papers. If you then had a job recommendation system that was recommending for women, oh, you're more likely to get a nurse job, therefore I'll recommend that you're a nurse, or recommend to a man you're more likely to get a doctor. You know, again, you're reinforcing the biases that exist, so you don't want that. So <coughs> there's lots of different um, reasons that, that algorithms go wrong. Um, I've just mentioned a few of those. So, what do you do about it? Um, well, there's, there's a bunch of groups now working on principles for, for machine learning, or for, for algorithms in general, but particularly for machine learning. So one of those, that, that, that's the nice one, is this principles for accountable algorithms. This comes out of the Fairness, Accountability and Transparency in, uh, in Machine Learning Group uh, in New York, or, well, actually global really, but, but, but based, based out of New York. The, um, so they've got five principles, and there's, if, you go to, um, if you Google that, you'll find it. Uh, responsibility, so this is making sure that there is a human who is responsible for an algorithm in practice, right? If an algorithm's out there in use, make sure there's a human you can track down. <laughs> and not only a human you can track down, there is a way that anyone affected by the algorithm can get redressed when they've had ad adverse um, you know, treatment from that algorithm. So you can actually track it back to a human and deal with the human eventually, right? That's responsibility. Second, explainability. You need to be able to, if you're, if you're building an algorithm, you need that to be able to be explained to somebody. And that doesn't mean show them the source code of, you know, it means actually show what the factors, that it, what the features in the, in the feature space that are being used to train it, what the assumptions are, what the utility function is, you know, which is, you know, the understanding of what the purpose of what you're doing is, you know, what the, um, the relative preferences of different potential outcomes is, and so on. Or to build it, you know, it needs, someone needs to be able to come in, look at the algorithm, look at what's happening, make sure it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. And that doesn't mean that everything has to be tr totally transparent, because sometimes making it, making it transparent can, can lead to gamification. You know, uh, you know pe people, ga sorry, people gaming an algorithm to get some social security benefit or something. So, you, so it's not always about exposing it, but there should, a third party should be able to come in and audit. And they're now starting to be algorithm auditing companies, like Cathy O'Neill, who I mentioned before, runs an algorithm auditing company, so people you know, can, can check. Um, okay. um, accuracy, of course you want your algorithm to be accurate, um, and you know, that means also capturing uncertainty, measuring uncertainty of, of your prediction. You're not just, you know, if you're making a prediction, you need to have a level of accuracy, you need to have your, your certainty associated with that, but, but the algorithm itself needs to be accurate. And fairness, um, and I'll say more about fairness now. And there's an interesting inter inter relationship between accuracy and fairness. You can't actually be, um, you know, they're, they're fighting each other all the time, as I'll say in, in a minute. Okay, so what we're doing now is we, we are actually applying these principles ourselves. Uh, we do a lot of work in machine learning, and, um, and we are doing work specifically on ethically aware machine learning. And uh, particularly in areas of government where you've got the sorts of examples I gave before, you know, we, we're doing quite a lot of work on that. And a lot of this work that we're doing came about because we noticed a lot of... Uh, government agencies and companies were adopting, you know, they're buying in machine learning tools or downloading uh, open source software, they, they're getting their data, and they really were using machine learning in a way that was not necessarily, you know, when you're making, when you're using machine learning to do interventions, you're having a massive impact, you can have a massive impact on people's lives. If you're deciding whether or not someone's going to get a home loan, if you're deciding whether or not someone's going to get an educational intervention, this can be totally transformative in their life, right? You don't want to get it wrong. So you need to make sure that your algorithms are ethical. 
So um, I won't say much about these. I'd love to have longer, but I don't. But just a few of them. Audibility. Yeah, we've got really detailed data pipelines which are totally reproducible, always from the original data. We make sure that our, our tools, um, everything, every assumption that's made, every change to the data, it all happens automatically and all in a, in, in a pipeline. When I say automatically, it's all written down in a clear specification you know, in, in code that someone can then check for scrutiny. No one has changed anything, so it's totally visible. Um, accuracy, we're working, we do things like um, really well-defined imputation. You know, when you, you're imputing data that you don't have, all the missing data, there's lots of data missing all the time. How do you make those assumptions about what data you use instead? We've got that really well, well, well documented. We're using things like, um, <coughs> there's always uh, tracking uncertainty. We're always, um, we're using things like K-model, K um, uh, <coughs> sorry, K-mode uh, cross-validation to make sure we're, we're not overfitting to the data. Uh, we're doing things like uh, automatically detecting covariant shift and, and um, uh, so if, if, the, if your, the t data you've trained on is different from the data you've been presented, we're recognising that, doing things like uh, test data re-weighting, uh, re uh, active sampling and things like that to make sure that our pr predictions are as accurate as possible. And more on fairness. So fairness, you know, I talked about some of the biases in data. You also get issues with feedback loops and so on. So lots of issues in a sort of, in a, in a blind machine learning system. Um, fairness, if, if you're not aware of it, is, is it's actually much more complicated than it sounds. You've got these two um, overall documents, <laughs> doctrines. Uh, one is this, this concept of disparate treatment. For fairness, you want to make sure you've got procedural fairness. You're treating everybody the same. They have equal opportunity. Um, and, and also disparate impact, which, which is more about distributive justice, which was being talked about by Cass this morning, um, where you're trying to minimise the inequality of the outcome. Those are quite different concepts, and they lead to quite different algorithmic um, constraints in machine learning. <clears throat> and then there's different ways of measuring fairness. Lots of different ways. Uh, we've been implement, We've actually implemented um, a whole bunch of different ways of, of measuring fairness. And but what's important? Um, so, for example, whether you're talking about uh, whether similar individuals are being treated similarly, whether you're talking about a particular class, which might be a gender or a race, uh, not being disadvantaged. But the important thing is making sure that you specify what measure of fairness you are using in a particular algorithm in a particular context for a particular reason and why, right? And that all stakeholders involved, the policy owner, the, the people affected by it, can see what you mean by fairness and can, can actually explicitly see it. So re removing all these assumptions out of the code and into something people can see is really what this is all about. So the take-home message, really simple take-home message. If you're using data about people, and I think probably a lot of you are, to build predictive models, and I think you know, lots of people are starting to do that more, then acting on those models and affecting people's lives, please understand deeply what you're doing with the data. It's not enough just to go and grab something off the shelf and use it and hope it works. You have to understand what you're doing with the data. You have to understand the context it's come from, the context of capture, how it's being used. You need to follow the principles for accountable algorithms and ensure that your data-driven interventions are ethically aware. Now, we're, um, we're build, we've been building out for the last couple of years, building out a suite of tools, and we're actually going to be releasing those. We want, we want everybody to be building ethical algorithms, so we're going to be open sourcing a lot of that stuff to encourage lots of government agencies, lots of banks to, um, to build more ethically aware systems. Um, and uh, so hopefully they will. <laughs> so thanks for that. Thank you, Bill. I think that was a really salutary message there about data is not numbers, data is people, and that the data needs to be looked after as though it represents people. So thank you for that. Um, the final talk before we move into the question part of uh, this session is from, there we go, is from Beck Weeks. Beck is Senior Advisor for BETA, the Behavioural Economics Team for Australian Government, who of course are, are hosting this conference. And she's just spent the last five months as visiting fellow in Harvard University's Department of Economics and Data Science Initiative. She's also a research affiliate at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, she's, she's been around this, this scene for quite some time, having also worked at Bain Consulting as a project manager. She's got an MBA from Harvard and a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Sydney. Uh, Beck's going to highlight what data and machine learning can tell us about ourselves. And uh, to do that, she'll do that by means of highlighting the Harvard, MI Harvard and MIT research into building tools that help individuals examine their own social media communication and their own health data in order to learn more about themselves. 
She's going to discuss the application of natural language processing to email data, particularly in detecting unconscious bias such as sexist language and attitudes. One of the major problems in behaviour science is intention action gaps, where individuals often have the stated intention but fall short of executing, such as losing weight or going to the gym or filling in your tax return, all those things we heard about this morning. Uh, but an even greater problem, however, is becoming motivated to form a healthy intention in the first place. So Beck's going to discuss the importance of feeding an individual's data back to them in order to help them form positive behavioural intentions. And I, for one, am looking forward to being able to apply that in practice. So welcome, Beck. Okay. There are some behaviours that are undeniable. If someone walked into this room and onto this stage right now and grabbed the clicker out of my hand, there'd be no debate about whether or not that interruption happened. But now think about a situation in the workplace. Say I'm in a meeting and I'm midway through a point and uh, a man interrupts me. I might be tempted to claim, hey, you interrupted me because I'm a woman. You're biased. But it's possible to know that he interrupted me and we could have a separate debate about whether we like being interrupted at work, but it's, it's not possible to know whether he was biased in that moment because bias doesn't happen in moments. Bias is exhibited in the aggregate. And so detecting bias is a data science problem. So how can we tell if we're biased? Uh, mostly we rely, sorry, yeah, it's a data science problem. Mostly we rely on looking back over what we've done to think about whether we're biased or not. We rely on our memory. So let me tell you about a memory. Not one of mine, but one of Ulrich Nieses. So he was one of the great uh, cognitive psychologists and he would often recount the exact moment uh, when he heard that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. And I want to use his own words here. So he said, for many years I have remembered how I heard the news of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which occurred on the day before my 13th birthday. I recall sitting in the living room of our house. We only lived in that house for one year, but I remember it well, listening to a baseball game on the radio. The game was interrupted by an announcement of the attack, and I rushed upstairs to tell my mother. Powerful memory. But here's the thing, Pearl Harbor was attacked in December. That's winter in the Northern Hemisphere, and they don't play baseball in winter. So this flashbulb memory, which glowed so intensely for him, was entirely an illusion. It couldn't possibly have happened. So Nisa's experience reveals a deeper truth, one that decades of cognitive science has uncovered, and that is that our autobiographical memory is incredibly faulty. We are entirely unreliable narrators of our own past. Okay, so we need data to be able to tell whether we're biased or not, but the data that we have is corrupted. So what to do? If you're thinking that we must have tons of data on ourselves, you're right. Think about the way we live our lives every day. Think about every location you've navigated to, every article you've read. Think about every ride share that you've taken, everything you've bought online, every track you've ever listened to, every show you've binged watched, every call you've placed or message that you've sent, um, and every post you've ever made out there on the internet. We leave data trails everywhere these days. Okay, so we've got all this data. What do we need? What we need is apps that can harness your own individualized data and let you analyze it for yourself. So Bill mentioned before the idea of personalizing some of our work in this field. This is all about taking a data set that is you. It's the data set of you and you can access it and tap into it to uncover things about yourself. So I've been working on some ideas for the kinds of apps that we could develop um, in this space, working with this set of people who all wear many hats, um, Joey Ito, Sandra Molenarvan, and the Venerable Tenzin Priyadashi. Um, they all do many things, but together what we've been thinking about is this opportunity at the intersection of technology and behavioral science to create applications that allow you as a user to take your own data sets that are out there and then use that vast set of data about yourself to better understand yourself. 
So let me tell you about one of the things that we've been working on, which is an app called Knowing Me. We've been experimenting with um, analyzing an individual's email data set and using natural language processing algorithms, amongst other statistical tools, to see if we can detect gender bias in email. So some of the natural language processing algorithms we've used relate to politeness, sentiment, the degree to which you linguistically coordinate with others. Um, but even we've found that some of the more simple analytical tools can be super useful. So one of our testers um, found that he was writing back to women at a much lower rate than the rate he was writing back to men. And he had no sense that he was doing this. Now, this finding prompts a whole host of follow-up questions. You know, maybe, given the hierarchical structure in his workplace, um, maybe it makes sense that he's replying to women at a lower rate because it could be that he's asking questions of women, they're replying with the information that he needs, and that's the end of the conversation. Um, but maybe not. And the point is that knowing what's happening in the aggregate, our user can now become a data scientist of his own data, start to dig into the details, and find out what might be driving this discrepancy, a discrepancy that he had no idea even existed until he saw this finding revealed at this aggregate level. So let me briefly talk you through a couple of other examples of technologies that are seeking to do similar things so you get a sense of what's out there. One is called Woman Interrupted. Now this is an app that analyzes your conversations. And if you're a woman, it shows you how often you're being interrupted. Uh, or if you're a man, how often you're interrupting others. And it uses the microphone on your phone to capture your conversations. So both this and the gender bias um, email app are allowing your, you to see yourself unfiltered um, as you are in your emails and conversations. And uh, you know, yes, I'm sure we, we all want to make sure that we're keeping um, our privacy concerns in check as we record our conversations. But it's just an example of these are the kinds of technologies. You know, if you just think about how can you use a microphone then to capture, you could capture tones of conversation. You could capture whether somebody's raising their voice in a conversation. You could capture in meetings um, just the share of voice in a conversation. So in a meeting amongst men and women, you know, do women or men have more of a share of voice in that conversation? Um, so that's, there are so many possibilities once you think about the kinds of data we can tap into. Uh, let me also tell you about Immersion, which is something that came out of uh, MIT's Media Lab. So Immersion gives you, um, it uses your email data to show you your network over time and gives you the ability to see how that's changed over time. So let's look at this sample data set. Um, in this sample data set, we're looking at a period of emails a year ago. Um, a year long, a year ago. And in this email data set, imagine that's yours, you were emailing a lot with Travis. Okay, so, and you see that the rest of, you can see the nodes and how Travis connects into the rest of your network. Jump forward a year to the, the next year, and Travis, still in your network, but his role has, seems to have diminished quite a lot. So, there could be a lot of explanations for this. Um, maybe, actually, maybe you and Travis are closer than ever, but now you text all the time, or you call each other all the time so you don't email each other. That could be one reason to explain what's going on. Or maybe, um, maybe you're not as much in touch with Travis anymore. And even that finding could have numerous drivers. Maybe you were very close when you worked together, but now you don't work together anymore and you've lost that common ground and you've just sort of drifted apart. Or maybe one of you moved away and it's been harder to connect. The point is, regardless of, of what happened, once you can see what's happened, you can dig into it and explore for yourself, okay, well, what's, what's happened here and what do I want to do about it? So you might think, gee, I, actually, I'd sort of forgotten that I've fallen out of touch with Travis. I want to get back in touch. I'll give him a call. Or you might take a more <coughs> philosophical take on the issue and think, wow, isn't it, just, isn't it interesting how much over the course of a year my network has changed and that people come in and out of your lives and um, isn't it crazy that we think that we live in a state of permanence when actually the only permanence is change. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's up to you. You can decide what your take on that data is. You're the data scientist of your own data set. So this is what Joey Sendall, Tenden and I have been thinking about. How can we use technology and the vast data sets that we have about ourselves to better understand who we are? And philosophers and thinkers across many cultures have suggested that the process of human flourishing relies on higher and higher levels of self-awareness. 
we can't change who we are unless we know who we are now. And as I think behavioural scientists, we're always focused on what's the behaviour change, what's the intervention, how are we driving behaviour change. We're suggesting let's take a step back and start by first understanding where we're at individually right now. So the examples I just walked through are just a few of the technologies that are percolating in this space now. Uh, and these apps, fueled by our own data, will help us with this incredibly challenging task of becoming better versions of ourselves because they help us hold up a mirror to our inner selves. Um, and that mirror allows us to continually see what we're doing, encourage this systematic loop of self-awareness uh, and, and provide us the ability to identify what we're doing and then self-correct our behaviours. If we can see who we are and what we do, we're much more likely to be able to change what we do. So I think often today we think about technology and all of the negatives that it brings into our lives. So how it draws us away from interacting with each other in person, or how it seems to be reducing our attention spans, um, how it can fuel endless comparisons of ourselves with others on social media. But we think that technologies like this offer us um, some opportunities to do some real good. Technology's changed many of the relationships in our lives, but this new wave of technologies is set to change one of the most important relationships that we have, the relationship we have with ourselves. Thanks. Thank you, Beck. That was a, a fantastic way to finish off a suite of four talks by really bringing it back to us as individuals and how we can play within this system. So thank you, everybody. They, they worked together really well. When I saw the, the speakers and I saw the set of abstracts, I thought we've got a, a really good set of... Um, information here to take us on a bit of a journey and in fact um, my role now is to spend just a couple of minutes bringing some threads together and for the first couple of talks I was thinking oh yikes I, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to find threads here but in fact there's, there's a, quite a lovely story I think and that is the convergence of a few different strands of, of, um, of processes and approaches that are becoming rapidly mature and we can see can work together. So for example, um, the growing maturity of behavioural economics as a science and the, the view that it should be put to service um, of the public to, to create better outcomes. Uh, the existence now of very large linked longitudinal databases uh, where confidentiality is well, well managed. Um, that can be analysed using both existing and evolving techniques, so existing techniques around um, statistics and econometrics and the evolving techniques of machine learning, to inform predictions around behaviour in both cohorts and personally. Um, so all of this is coming together. We see some case examples, but it's not yet mature or systemic. Um, we have things to deal with still around confidentiality, around um, managing bias. Um, Bill gave us some really uh, good insights into some principles around um, accountable algorithms. And then finally, we saw that not only can we have systems and experts do this, but we're moving to be able to converge to doing it for ourselves and understanding ourselves better through the techniques that, by and large, up until now, have been the, the purview of um, people with you know, long, many years of university learning behind them and practice. Um, and I'm reminded, um, just having left New Zealand, that Maori proverbs are all often brought into to play. And there's one that says, what is the most important thing in the world? And the answer is, hetangata, hetangata, hetangata. It's people, it's people, it's people. And that's what went through my mind as I was listening to the presentations. So, so thank you for that. And um, we'll, we'll throw open for questions now. And I'll, I'll, start, I'll take the, um, the lead on asking the first question, which I'll ask of everyone on the panel, so a, a sort of a snappy answer. Um, but it's around being transparent about all this work and helping others understand what's, what's in play here. So, so what role does transparency have in building trust when we're using these techniques to, um, to create greater public good. So I'll go right the way down the panel and then we'll open it up to the floor. So, Michael. Okay, I should have sat somewhere else. <laughs> uh, 
So I think as with everything we've been doing in behavioral insights over the last however long we've been doing it, like transparency, we, just, we should be as transparent as we can be and no more transparent than that, which is a non-answer, I guess. So there is always a risk of gaming of algorithms if we, t if we tell people exactly what we're doing, if we publish exactly what it is on the internet, people can try and get out of having uh, social workers be able to see what's going on in their lives, they can try and claim social security benefits legitimately. That kind of gaming is probably reasonably low risk in most cases though, um, and with machine learning algorithms and, measure and decisions made on the basis of that, it can be much harder to game than more traditional uh, techniques of analysis because it's just so much more complicated and so much harder to see into the black box. So we should be transparent about where we're using um, machine learning. We should be transparent about what we're using it for. And if it's being used to make decisions, we should, as has been mentioned, have an, an, an accountability such that you can find the human being who pressed go on the algorithm or pressed go on the decision making that came out of it and say, why did you do that? And why didn't you reflect and stop and, and look at it again? So I think that's... Thank you. Sarah. Uh, yes, I think that transparency is really important, particularly for um, government organisations. Uh, there are challenges around transparency though, um, explaining to people what you're doing, um, not worrying people by explaining too much, um, and there's certainly things that StatsNZ and other government agencies are grappling with at the moment about how to be transparent in a way that's helpful, not scary. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question, interesting topic. Um, and I think it's evolving. Transparency is evolving. I mean, I think that the, there are times at which people think that you want full transparency. There are times where, where it starts, close, to, starts to, to, to not be such a good idea. I, I gave the example of, of, of gaming, as, as did Michael. Um, Michael doesn't seem to be worried about gaming. I, I actually, I am, um, being a computer scientist and software engineer. I think yeah, there's a big field at the moment called adversarial machine learning, where you're predicting how machine learning, or you're you're working out, you're, you're able to um, predict what a machine learning algorithm is doing, and you're able to to game it, right? So algorithmically game something else, and this is used, for example, to automatically generate images that have, uh, you know, it looks like a road sign, but it actually get treated like a, a zebra or something. Yeah, so so pr pretty crazy stuff, some of it, but the. If you make all your algorithms transparent, someone will, will work out some systematic way to actually deal, uh, deal with that. So auditability is really important. Uh, and enough transparency to provide the auditability, I think, I think is, is probably is, is good enough. Um, if, if, if you can be fully transparent, be fully transparent, but there are definitely times where you shouldn't be. But. Um, I guess on transparency with the work we've been doing, we were thinking a lot about the kinds of people who have access to your own data, the sort of data that I talked about. Typically, it's you know advertisers, or you know, Cass was asked earlier about Cambridge Analytica. There are a lot of people who are using the kinds of data um, sources that I was talking about currently, sort of against you, or at least for their own purposes, to serve you political ads or serve you ads for products. Um, and I guess to some of what uh, Bill talked about as well, those are all based on things you've done in the past, not necessarily about the person you might want to be in the future. So part of what we've been thinking about is transparency around the way that advertisers and others are using the data about your past behaviour. You know, if you could, could know about what they're using and also if then you could shift that a little bit so that you could say, well, yes, last week I bought 10 chocolate bars, but actually I'm really serious about this whole healthy eating thing, so don't serve me any more ads for chocolate next week. You know, understanding what they're using to serve you those ads and then being able to not just go, go further than transparency and instead having control. We've been thinking about that in, in this space with this, the use of this kind of data a lot. Thank you. Who's going to start with a question from the floor? So we've got a hand up. Have we got a mi roving microphone? We have a roving microphone, so we can make it happen. Thank you. Uh, Sam Haynes from the Behavioural Insights team. My question is for Michael and Beck. Um, do we assume that if someone has more knowledge and is well-intentioned, that the, that knowledge will be good for them? And is that a mistake? So give two examples, both from your studies. So from Michael, imagine a social worker has access to the feedback tool you've created. It gives them more knowledge and therefore they're presumably better able to do their job. But they accidentally, despite being well-intentioned, shift the way they write their case notes because of the model and therefore make the model not work and in fact may make their case notes worse and less predictive. And for Beck, similarly, imagine uh, a woman in the workplace who finds she's interrupted constantly, so stops talking at all. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stop talking at all. Uh, no, 
So that's definitely a risk. I think the advantage, the reason we've chosen social worker case notes as a place to start here is because they are pseudo-legal, there is a way in which they have to be written and a way in which social workers are trained to write them. So they don't actually have a great deal of wiggle room about the way in which they do choose to write them. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is who actually has control over the output from that algorithm. So at the moment in the pilots we're looking to run, it's going to be the team leader, the manager, who doesn't write the case notes rather than the social worker themselves so that the social worker doesn't have that sort of instinctive sort of, oh, when I type this, this comes up and that kind of thing. It's also why we focused on cases where they've already made the decision not to take any further action. Um, so it's not, you'd, it's not clear what direction they'd want to game it in. Um, so, but it's definitely a risk, and that's why we need to keep on running these models over and over again, why that sort of BI element of it is going to be absolutely important to taking this into the fields. How do we design the tool itself so that it doesn't alter the quality of the data that we're getting in? Yeah, and I guess for my part, I'd say hopefully somebody who's bothering to access this kind of data, the hope is that they're coming to it with, with good intentions um, and being open to seeing a finding. I guess on the specific example, I mean, I think... Anecdotally, you'd hear probably in the workplace that a woman who feels like she's being interrupted but has no data to support that just ends up feeling stymied. And actually what this would do is say, no, you, you are. There is something going on. Here's something you could go to have a conversation with someone. It's a concrete piece of data. You can't really, you can't argue with the facts as they're presented. Now let's have a conversation about what it means, about how we actually then create a workplace that doesn't encourage that kind of constant interruption that creates a... a you know, a more um, collaborative environment for both genders. So hopefully it's providing the, the sort of objective data so you can have those conversations without it just becoming a, you know, he said, she said, he interrupted situation. Thank you. Up the back. Hi, uh, Mark Costa from the ATO. Um, Sarah, for you. Um, uh, impressive data repository you do have. Um, can individuals view and potentially change the data that IDI has? Um, and also, do you see that there's a risk that con consolidated sources of de-identified data can become identified? Okay. Uh, the uh, answer to the first question is because of the privacy laws in New Zealand, yes, you can request access to your information from anywhere in government. Uh, the complexity we face is that um, when we link the information, oh, so New Zealand doesn't have a social security number or a unique identifier, so when we link your information to our spine, a lot of the time um, agencies like tax or health will give us some type of identifier so we can link your health record with your education record, but for a percentage of that time we don't have that direct link, so we use probabilistic matching, uh, which is great because it's probably you, and we're fairly confident that it's you, but I can't give you that information because I'm not 100% sure it's you. So there is some complexity for us, so our answer, um, and what's really hard is how do I explain to someone what I just said if they're not <laughs> statistical? Um, and we have had to do that recently, and it's really hard because people don't understand why they can't, why we can't just look in the data and see the string that is Sarah Minson. So explaining that is hard, but they are allowed to have access to it. Our advice so far has been um, you need to go back to the source agencies and ask them one by one, which is slightly painful, but um, so you are allowed to. Can you change it? Same thing. Um, you need, because we are the holder of the government's data, um, what we have done is said, if you think your information about education is wrong, go back to education and correct it, and we take regular feeds, so it will self-correct. Uh, ditto if you want your data removed. So if you say, I do not want my data in that big joined up government database, again, you need to go back to the source agency, say education or health, and say, please don't send my data to StatsNZ, and then it's up to them as to whether or not their processes can handle that. A um, second question about identifying people. Um, because we remove, so we remove name, address and your day of birth um, and then we encrypt things like tax numbers and stuff. Um, it is possible for a researcher to identify an individual because there are lots of other pieces of information about me in that string where people could potentially identify me but we have a whole lot of other processes in place to protect that so we adopted the five safes model from England and other places so we make sure that the researchers pass referee checks so not anyone can access the data so you need to be a certified researcher 
um, the research project itself has to be for statistical purposes, so we protect uh, confidentiality by making sure the research isn't about um, finding and identifying groups of people. It has to be for public good, the research. Um, you have to be in an authorised environment, so in a safe data lab that has no access to the internet, so the data doesn't have to be on our premises, but there are certain um, requirements for access. Um, the data is de-identified itself, and then the data, the researcher has to confidentialise, aggregate and confidentialise the data, and Stats New Zealand checks that, and once we're happy, then we email it to you. So we have those five things in place that um, protect confidentiality, so we're, um, we're confident. And a researcher, of course, can identify somebody in the data, or could attempt to. Um, it's like a one-strike policy. If you break it, you're out forever. So we have quite stringent... Um, penalties for people who don't play the game properly. Um, so we've got two, we'll take one front and then further back. Hi, um, my name is Josh Levy, I'm a student at UNSW, University of New South Wales. And I was wondering how you guys deal with missing data specifically, data that might be missing for systematic reasons. Thanks. Who would like to? Uh, well, I didn't say what. Well, if you send me your details afterwards, I could send you a whole uh, slide <laughs> back about how to deal with the imputation of missing data for machine learning. Um, it's an area we spend a lot of time doing, trying to do properly. It's hard to do it right. A lot of people don't do it well, and I'm happy to send you a slide back, but it's, it's not a simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> It's fair to say that the machine learning aspect adds a whole other layer of complexity, but it's also one part of the solution. So if you work in official statistics and you do sample surveys or you do a census, there's really well-known and well-understood <laughs> techniques for imputation, but as the world's getting more complicated, they need to get more complicated as well. Yeah. 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 So that's a very layperson's answer to a technical question. <laughs> uh, Hi, my name is Claire Power. I'm from the New South Wales Behavioural Insights Unit. Um, I was just wondering, what is the responsibility that you think the government has in feeding back to citizens the predictive information that we have? So, for example, from Stats NZ, there was the information that a person, a child who exhibits various risk factors, is more likely to be on sole parenting benefit at the age of 21. What responsibility does government have to the parents of that child or even to the child itself in communicating the information back to them? Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll start and maybe Sarah can jump in. Um, so the legislation that operates in Australia and New Zealand around these data repositories is very much that the work that can be done can only be done at a cohort level. So you can identify uh, groups that have certain characteristics, but you can't then say, now let's go find the exact people that have those characteristics and interact with them. Um, ministries of Social Development or um, DSS here have that responsibility, but again, when they use the data that we have available, it can only be done at a cohort level. So, so you could go, you, you could make um, statements in general about if you're a person that has these sort of characteristics, then what we tend to see is the following. You know, there's a fairly high chance that you or your children may end up in this sort of situation. Um, we can perhaps support you through that and try and see if we can reach a different outcome. But they can't use that information to actually go and target people and say, you're one of these people, we're going to do things to you. So yeah, the only thing I'd add to that yeah. is that um, the information about the research is publicly available. So if you are interested in the research, uh, we work quite hard to get the media to get the stories out there. Um, the, we put as many of the research projects as we know about on our website. The agencies that are doing the research will do the same. So if there is positive research out there um, or research um, that says if you um, are a mother with a qualification, your child is more likely to succeed in life, agencies can get that information out there in a general sense for all of us um, through the media and through the website in terms of what the obligation of the government is to do that, it's a good question. I, I don't really know. I agree with Teresa. We don't target the individuals, but there is a huge amount of, of research that is publicly available that us as individuals could get if we wanted to. Can I 
So I think we probably need to be quite careful when we're thinking about feeding back this information to people. So we've a lot of the work which we've done in the UK and elsewhere with the Behavioural Insights team is around trying to get young people from non-traditional families to uh, get better grades, get more likely to go to university, get better, get, get better jobs afterwards. What we're trying to do is use behavioural insights to make it so that demography is not destiny. What we risk doing with giving people too much information is making it so that de data becomes destiny. There was a television programme that aired in the UK last year that was just horrifying, where you have unbelievably bright 11, 12, 13 year olds from disadvantaged backgrounds and disadvantaged towns who are saying, I'm not going to apply to university because people like me, people from places like this don't go to university. If I come along and say, well, I've done some fancy machine learning using artificial intelligence and all other kinds of clever things, um, and the machine says you've got a 95% chance of not going to university, then that's just going to cement that and concrete that. I think what we need to do is exactly the opposite, is say, there's 5%. How do we... That 5% of people who currently go is terrible, but it's fine. You, you can be in that 5%. Let's make that 5%, 10%, and so on, rather than feeding back, like, you have this horrible future ahead of you in some probability if we do nothing and if things stay the way they are. Because things are not going to stay the way they are, and we have options between them staying the way they are, getting better or getting worse. And so we should probably pick the getting better one. I'd agree with that. And then, then what can government and other um, institutions do to turn that 5% into 10% and to help that 5% have a better experience when they go to uni. Yep. Yeah. There was a question down the front, uh, two down the front, so maybe right in the front row and then behind. Oh, but there's one there first. So we'll take one, two, three, and then I think that's probably going to be all we can have time for. So I've got the microphone. Anthony Carpenter from the Victorian Department of Health and manager of our integrated data set. It might be a question for Michael because we're thinking about doing similar um, artificial intelligence projects in the human services space for vulnerable clients using our linked administrative data set. My question is about detecting decision bias in retrospective cohort analyses to use as a prospective risk identification tool and whether you've had any um, methods or working on any techniques to avoid using bias decisions which may have existed in the human services space in the past about child outcomes, for example, to base on prospective risk identification tools and decision support tools for human services workers. So this is an area which we are thinking a lot about as we expand out the program of work. I don't have a good answer for you yet. Um, the short answer at the moment is that what we've tried to do is what we're what we're predicting is bias, right? We are predicting cases where a social worker says, nothing to see here, and it turns out six months down the line, there is something to see there. We are looking for those biases as they exist in the decisions that are being made. The, the outcomes, the left-hand side, the thing we're predicting is child, children being hospitalized because their parents have beaten them and other very, very serious outcomes that are in some sense objective. So what we're looking for, what we're trying to predict is where do we have Objectively, something bad happens within the next six months, something objective and bad, where a human process has failed to pick that up due to either bias or just uh, a lack of salience. Um, and let's use the machine to try and identify and target that, rather than sort of trying to remodel and run that risk of, be of baking in that bias. We're, we're going hunting for it. Thank you. So we'll take those two questions down the front here. Thanks. Hi, Marian O'Loughlin from New South Wales Department of Premier and Cabinet. Um, my question's for Beck, and it draws upon a question that was asked earlier. Um, I kind of want you to have the future, Beck, because I thought these people here was really interesting, and they're telling us we've got the data now, and then we're going to hold the data, and as government, we're going to go and do really good things to people. You're saying people own your data and, you know, kind of shape your life a lot more. So I think our answers before were a little bit conventional, so I want you to tell us now how we can tell that data, give it to you, change your life, because you're right about the 95% are kind of not looking too good, but there's 5% in that data set that have got other answers. So I want Beck to have the data, and I, I just think you've got to jump forward a bit more and so what can we do to empower more people with their data? Well, I think it will, I mean, and I, I definitely have the utmost respect for all of my fellow <laughs> panel members and their, their aforementioned positions. Um, maybe I'll talk about one example where, you know, some, exactly what Michael said before, where if you can, sharing the data when there's still 
a good opportunity to jump in and change things could be really helpful. So one thing we were looking at was, um, you know, in the US, uh, a lot of the universities use platforms that manage every aspect of somebody's uh, educational interactions. So they're watching lectures online, they're doing quizzes online throughout the semester. And they've done a lot of predictive modeling to say, hey, guess what? You actually haven't opened this platform in the first uh, four weeks of semester. And people like you who have done that and then continue to not open the platform tend not to do very well in the semester. So if you could, for instance, at that point say, you might want to get your act together and open the platform and start watching the lectures, doing the quizzes, doing the readings, getting engaged in your class, there's a chance to turn it around. And so I think sharing the information and giving people then the tools to understand well, what's the behaviour I could then undertake to change the course, to change the trajectory that I am otherwise currently on, I think that kind of is probably one of the, the kinds of use cases where sharing that information back can be really powerful. Thank you. And we're our last final question. Thank you. Gabriel denning Cotter, Prime Minister and Cabinet. I think my question is to Bill, but I'm happy for anyone to answer. And I'm interested in the challenges in social licence, um, building social licence with machine learning, particularly when it's difficult to understand what it is that we're doing. I think, Sarah, you talked about explain. It's difficult to explain. So any reflections on building social licence for using machine learning? So I think the, those principles for responsible algorithms is a good starting point because each of those ones, it, it, you know, it's, it's targeted for, for better scrutiny of what's actually happening and I think that's critical. Um, so that's a good starting point, but I'll let the other panellists talk. Any final comment on social licence? I would agree. I think we've had a few issues um, recently in New Zealand where it wasn't so much that the agency was using um, algorithms or predictive modelling, it was the fact they couldn't explain it adequately in time. They weren't prepared. And if they had been prepared, the story probably would have gone away overnight. But as soon as the journalists get a sense of the fact you can't explain it and the public go, you can't explain it, then it's all over. <laughs> and that's a good note to end on. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sarah, Bill and Beck. That was a really good session.